just to add a little bit on to what Sean was saying as he was closing, because um, that's something that he and I have actually been thinking about a lot. Um, and it's that sort of way of learning to be with God and engage with the Holy Spirit is actually something we're going to be talking about a lot more um, in the coming, well, years, honestly. It's going to begin to mark how the Rock of Roseville does stuff. But just to give you else, something else to chew on, maybe mess up your Sunday a little bit if I'm lucky. Um, the degree to which you are uncomfortable sitting in silence with God is the degree to which you are running from your own soul. <laughs> the degree to which you are uncomfortable sitting in silence with God is the degree to which you are running from your own soul. Because what, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, what usually makes us uncomfortable with sitting in silence, it's how our mind starts running, and then, realistically, how much our anxiety starts flaring up. And we're so uncomfortable with sitting down to a point where God can actually bring what's in you to the surface that we are like, I will find anything else to fill that space, even if it's good religious activity. Can I tell you this morning that you can actually use God to hide from God? <laughs> Give me scripture for that, Aaron. I'd be happy to. <laughs> There's a prophet in the Bible where he's delivering this word against Israel, and he's giving voice to what God's saying. He's, God's saying, I'm actually sick of your new moon feasts. I'm sick of your sacrifices. You do all this stuff, but your hearts are far from me. I was not planning on talking about this today, but here we are. You're welcome. <laughs> it will actually tie in a little bit to what I'm going to talk about this morning, but it's actually possible to get so caught up in the doing that you know to be right, and that is even good in the right context, that you've actually begin to, began to lose touch with your own heart before God and with what God is actually asking of you. There's some wheels turning and it's a good thing. <laughs> Jesus, help us, help me today. Amen. <laughs> Short and simple prayers are usually pretty good. We're gonna be in Jonah chapter four today. How many of you guys have been enjoying the uh, Jonah series that we've been in? This has been good. Some of you guys are apparently still recovering from what I just dropped out there for you. You're just like, give me the deer in the headlights look. It's okay. We are going to be in Jonah chapter four. I'm only going through the first four verses of Jonah chapter four. Um, short, but there's a lot there to unpack. Uh, and it's going to be a good, good morning. So starting in verse one, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? So to catch us up with the narrative as it's been flowing, Jonah's just delivered this word that God went to great lengths to make sure he actually delivered to Nineveh, caught him in the middle of the sea, in the belly of this big fish. This fish vomits him onto dry land. Jonah, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Jonah says, okay, I will listen to you this time. I will go, I will give the word. And he's delivering this word through Nineveh saying in 40 days, Nineveh is going to fall and God's going to destroy it. And then we see Nineveh actually responds to the preaching of Jonah to the point where even the king makes a proclamation and says, everybody's going on a water only fast, animals included. We're wearing sackcloth and ashes, we're mourning, and maybe God will actually relent and turn from this. And then the verse just before chapter four, in uh, chapter three, verse 10, God saw their actions, so they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from sending the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. 
And what's the prophet's response? He throws a hissy fit. <clears throat> he gets mad. And I think like what threw me for a loop and still does every time I read it is the reasons that Jonah gave for being upset. He says, that's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. He's basically saying, God, didn't I know that you were so good that you'd do something like this? Didn't I know that you would probably step in, if I came and delivered this word, that you'd probably step in and turn these people's hearts around, and that's actually why I left? which should give us pause. It's really easy for us to identify with the, the way of thinking that a lot of us you know, would assume Jonah had. He's like afraid for his life. He's, you know, God's calling him to go to these people who had killed his friends, to Assyria, who's a nation who's known for being brutal, known for doing all sorts of horrible things to people. We can identify with that. But then Jonah comes in and he says, I'm actually really mad at you, God, because you are who you said you would be. And there's a few different reasons that church history has kind of brought to us to say, you know, maybe these are some of the reasons why Jonah was upset. The first one is a sense of Hebrew nationalism. If you go actually into the book of Kings, one of the Kings, we get this little snippet where it talks about Jonah and a prophetic word that he had given. And it talks about how the king at the time had actually expanded the borders of Israel because of a word that came through Jonah, which we don't get context, context for in the book of Jonah. But we see this thing here. So there's something in Jonah and it would have been prevailing at the time. And it stuck through all the way to Jesus where there's this understanding or this deeply entrenched thing within the people of Israel that they've start, started to lose this understanding that the reason God blessed them was so that the nations could be blessed through them. And they've started to go insular and have this understanding of God chose us because he said, forget everybody else. So now when God is actually acting in mercy towards people who don't specifically belong to Israel, one of the thought processes is Jonah sees that, gets offended, and he's angry. Another option that we have is he knew that Assyria would be Israel's downfall one day. If you follow the timeline of the people of Israel, Assyria was actually the nation that came in and delivered God's judgment against the people of Israel. They had forsaken the covenant. They had you know, done all the stuff that they knew they weren't supposed to do. So one thought process is that Jonah understanding and having, you know, being a prophet, having prophetic insight might have actually seen into this is what God's going to do and this is how he's going to do it. So he sees God actually saving the enemies of Israel and he gets offended. Another option we have is the stigma of being used to spare an enemy. You'll start to notice that all of these are very me-centric. All of these are very much about what Jonah thinks and what Jonah feels. But one option that's been talked about through church history is Jonah was probably afraid not only of the stigma that would be put on him of you actually went and preached to those people who are our enemies and now they've repented. There was that, but then there was also the stigma that Jonah may have been trying to avoid of God, you're making me look like a false prophet here. I told them 40 days because you told me to. I told them 40 days and their city would be destroyed. And now all of a sudden you're deciding to have mercy on them. God, that makes me look bad. Sometimes when God asks us to do things, he's not actually concerned about your reputation in the middle of it. And the degree to which we get lost in that, we get lost in our reputation over and above what God's asking us to do is when we've actually lost the heart of God. And we can see that with Jonah. Like we're, we're reading this chunk of scripture that in any other context would sound like worship. 
it sounds like a psalm. You're, and, and in many ways, he is quoting psalms. You're slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, showing mercy. We, if you were to just read that without the context, you think, oh, somebody's having a worship moment right now. And no, Jonah is complaining. He's actually lifting up an indictment to God. How dare you be this good? How dare you be this good? And another option is that people have thought that one of the reasons Jonah actually wanted this judgment to come is because Israel at the time had gotten very comfortable. They'd gotten very lax in their following of God. They've, you know, kind of gotten apathetic. So he might have been thinking, one of these options is, if they can see the word of the Lord come forward and then judgment actually gets released on these people, maybe this will wake them up. Maybe this will cause them to sort of snap out of whatever they're in and realize like, oh, God's real and he's powerful and maybe we need to get our acts together. But then the heart of God gets revealed and Sean will talk about this more next week, but then the heart of God gets revealed after Jonah's, you know, had his adult temper tantrum because God comes in and asks the question, is it right for you to be angry? Now, it's kind of weird that an all-knowing being would ask a question. Does that strike anybody else as a little odd? So what does that tell us? It tells us that when God's asking a question, it's not for his benefit, it's for ours. And even just the, the graciousness and the mercy that God chooses to respond to Jonah that way. He is being everything that Jonah has just accused him of being. God actually responds to Jonah with the same mercy, kindness, and graciousness that's being offered to Nineveh. Because... Think about it this way. If God was being who Jonah wanted him to be, number one, he wouldn't have been in the position to be complaining in the first place because let's not forget that he already disobeyed and ran. So let's not miss the irony here of he ran as far as somebody could run. Literally, that's why he went to Tarshish and was trying to go there because it's the exact polar opposite direction of where Nineveh was. Let's not miss the irony that this guy who is literally breathing because God was so for him and so for offering him a second chance that he miraculously delivered him from drowning by sending a fish to swallow him. That's the guy who's saying, God, I'm upset that you're as good as you are being right now. And guys, we do this all the time. There's something really weird that happens with a lot of us believers where once we get our acts reasonably cleaned up, that we somehow forget who we were and what we were like before Jesus found us. And we deliver all sorts of judgment, accusation, and to call it for what it is, we partner with the enemy's word over somebody else's life because we have forgotten who we were before Jesus found us. And to get to the heart of what that is, we're actually offended at God being as good as he is. There's a lot of reasons why we can think this way. Ultimately, I think one of the big ones is we, in our pride, we want to be able to control God. Let me break that down for you. What religion, what legalism actually is, is it's an attempt to control God's responses by saying, I have the list of all the things that he likes and doesn't like, and if I just do all the stuff, then he has to give me the response I'm looking for. That's 
that's at the core of why legalism is so dangerous. It's not just because you're going to find yourself sliding into a place of apathy. It's that you'll find yourself in Jonah's position where you see God being merciful, healing people, setting them free, and then leaving them in their mess, honestly, and being okay with their mess as they're growing up in him. We see that and we would find ourselves getting offended because God, that doesn't line up with all of the rules that I have in my head about how you are supposed to operate. And we find ourselves, to tie it in with another picture in scripture, we find ourselves in the place of the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son. You're putting a robe and a ring on this guy's finger. Have I not, and have I not been faithful in your house doing all the stuff that you've asked me to do and I've never once asked you for anything and now you're killing the fatted calf for this guy and you don't even give me a goat to celebrate with my friends? To paraphrase. And where that anger comes from, to drill down on that, where that unjust anger comes from is from an unmet expectation. God, you were supposed to do this and you didn't do it. I am mad at you now. As I was studying, there was this one liner that I just had to write down and share with you guys because it's going to burn in my mind, so I'm going to let it mess you up too. The Lord cannot be tamed on the leash of our expectations. The Lord cannot be tamed on the leash of our expectations. Even one of the other ways that this plays out, I've been practicing praying for the sick for a long time now. One of the number one things that I see being a block to people's healing is that they've actually got unvocalized and undealt with anger towards the Lord. And when you allow that to sit there, let me, let me be clear. God is not bothered by you being upset with him. God's got really good boundaries. He is not a codependent person. He's not hovering around you going like, are, are you good with me now? Like, are we okay? Like, I'm really, like, I, I, I saw you in worship. You didn't raise your hand and you did last week. Like, are, 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 am I, are we good? God's not like that. But how willing are you to receive anything from somebody that you're upset at and that you don't trust? So if you have this bitter root of unmet expectations towards the Lord that's actually beginning to entrench itself in your soul, you can come up, receive prayer time after time, time after time, and the Lord's gracious and he oftentimes will provide measures of breakthrough. But on a soul level, you're coming up here saying, I'm mad at you because you didn't meet my expectation in this other area, so why should I trust you and have faith for you to meet me here? these expectations that we have of the Lord oftentimes are just rooted out of legalism. We, we let ourselves slip into this place where, God, I know what you need to be doing. I'm going to stand back and watch and see if you do it. Which even just saying that out loud, that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And just to dive in a little bit more on just sort of the, another thing that caught me in all of this was just sort of the audaciousness of God's goodness towards Nineveh. The Hebrew understanding of that mercy that Jonah is actually talking about. Again, we think in very, in the West, we think in very black and white and legalistic terms. Like we, 
when we hear covenant, we think contract and we think, you know, like a, a governing law, we think judges, lawyers, things like that, which is actually maybe 10% of what covenant actually is. That's a whole other teaching. But we come to it with that sort of an understanding. So when we think mercy, we think, oh, you were supposed to get this punishment and now you're not, which again, you're catching maybe 10%. But the Hebrew understanding of this kind of mercy, the picture that it paints is of a mother that's bending over her baby's crib while it's crying and soothing it. This is the kind of mercy that God's showing to Nineveh in this moment, which again, for somebody who grew up following the law, grew up with an understanding of we're God's chosen people, Jonah's thinking, you're not in covenant with these people. Why are you giving this to them? Why are you acting this way towards them? And this is where Jonah starts to even point us towards the heart of the Father that makes a way for Jesus. Most of us in this room do not have Jewish backgrounds. And yet, God through Jesus has actually brought us in to that same covenant. He's grafted us in and made us that chosen people. And that is actually the craziness, the craziness of God's mercy. And God even asking a question like he does doesn't just cause Jonah to say, maybe I'm not right in thinking this way about this, but it actually reveals more of the father heart of God. If we're going to talk about points in the story where we get offended at how things are happening, it, it messes with our brains a bit, I think, to not see God coming in with a strong hand, basically backhanding Jonah and saying, like, get your act together, dude. Do you not remember two chapters ago where I gave you mercy? Sit down and be quiet. But God responds gently, mercifully with a question. Is it right that you're angry? Every time God asks you a question, not just every time God asks a question in scripture, but every time God asks you a question in your day-to-day -day relationship with him, every time that happens, that's an invitation into a deeper revelation of his heart. We even see this in the life of Jesus. When Jesus is turning to the disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? They, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the prophet. He turns to Peter and he says, who do you say that I am? Jesus was not having an identity crisis. Jesus knew exactly who he was. But him asking the question is extending to Peter. I'm actually inviting you into something. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in him asking that question and responding, he gets a revelation of this is not just an anointed prophet. This is the one we've been waiting for. And so even as God is asking Jonah this question, is it right that you would be angry? He's inviting Jonah into not just an understanding of black and white, should they be doing this? Should they not? Am I justified in tearing the city apart or not? He's pulling him into maybe just maybe I care a little bit more about people than you think I do. And here's the goodness of God. I'm, I'm going to specifically take a little detour to just kind of attack legalism here for a second. Oftentimes we fall into legalism because we think that God is after behavior modification. He doesn't actually care about being with you or being close to you or you feeling seen, known, and loved. He actually doesn't care about that. He just wants you to stop sinning. And when we approach God, when we approach the Bible with that understanding, you're going to end up frustrated. You're going to end up wondering what all of this is about. 
you're gonna end up responding to God like he's an angry, abusive father. Because when you come to the word, when you come to Jesus with an understanding of he's just after behavior modification from me, that creates an understanding of him in your own heart where he's hovering over you, just waiting for you to mess up so that he can bring the hammer down. So one of the things, even as God asks questions, you should ask him questions. One of the questions that I asked God that changed my life was, God, why do you actually have these rules in here? Why do you actually, like, wh why, why does sin bother you so much? And the response that I got was, Aaron, because I actually want my kids to thrive. So when you start to understand then that God doesn't give commandments for his sake, but he gives them for yours, changes everything. All I have to do to point to some of this is deliverance, deliverance ministry. How many of you guys have ever been set free from some sort of demonic oppression before? I'm raising my hand here. So the way that you got oppressed in the first place was you actually, there was an open door that was created and you transgressed a commandment that God gave. So the enemy coming in on that isn't God saying, yeah, you messed up, now I'm gonna punish you. It's God saying, look, I know how I created the world to work. If you start having premarital sex, if you start giving into unjust anger, which the Bible actually calls a spirit of murder. If you start giving into that stuff, you are opening up your heart and your soul and your body to all sorts of nastiness. So because I know that you might not be able to see that right now, I'm setting a line. Do not cross that because you're not going to like what's on the other side. God asking Jonah this question is actually inviting him into this understanding of you, son, you have my word, but you don't have my heart. And that's one of the things that's actually been stirring me over the last probably five years that God actually at one point confronted me and said, Aaron, you've been busy with much serving. And the context for him saying that to me, it comes from the story of Mary and Martha, where Martha's running around, she's doing all the stuff, she's doing what all of us know to do, like serving Jesus, she's doing something good. But Jesus actually steps in and gently rebukes her. You've been busy with much serving. And then he points to Mary who's sitting at his feet. And he says, she's chosen the better thing. So what God's been working on me, and I hope to, if I can in any measure impart this to you guys, what God's been working on in me, I can do all the right stuff and miss him completely. I can show up to all the worship nights, and if I'm running from him in my own heart, it's not going to be good for anything. I can do all the stuff. I can speak in tongues. I can prophesy. I can heal the sick. I can do all of that. But if my heart's far from God, it does not matter. I can know the right thing to say and hear this as we're, as we're even walking into an election season. You can know the difference between right and wrong, but if you don't deliver it with the heart of the Father, you are wrong. And that's where God can even ask Jonah the question, are you right to be angry? Oop. Glad there was a cap on that. <laughs> and so I even want to end... Our, our sermon today. We're going to take communion here in a moment, so ushers, you can start getting ready. But just with that question that God asked Jonah, are you right to be angry? Because if we're being honest with ourselves, everybody in here, 
we've either run into or are currently walking through something in our lives where God didn't show up the way we thought he should, whether that's through somebody who has hurt you, betrayed you, offended you, whether like it's looking at that person getting blessed and seeing their life go well, God, what are you doing? You know what that person did and you know what they're like. Why are you blessing them? And that's created an offense or it's God, you were supposed to show up this way and you didn't. And there's an offense there. And if you haven't hit that yet, give it a day. The difference is, will we have the humility that Jonah lacked to come back to God and say, God, I'm clearly missing something. What am I missing here? See, a lot of what Jonah has experienced and even the manifestation that we're seeing right now, this extreme level of anger. And just to, as a side note, give you some context for the kind of anger that he's feeling. This word for anger, and even Jonah's journey away from the presence of God that it mentions earlier in the book, is the same words in the same language that's used of Cain, from Cain and Abel. So we're not just talking about Jonah being upset. We're talking about somebody who's actually murderously angry. That level of anger, all of that's coming from that unmet expectation. And I just believe that even as I'm preaching and as we're talking this morning, and even, even just the nearness of God during worship, there, there are times in worship and in the presence of God where he'll, it's almost like joy explodes and there's fire and we're like going somewhere. Uh, and then there's times where it just, the sense is like God just comes down and is just near to us. Even worship being like that this morning, there's just an invitation for us to sit and reflect and go, God, where am I offended at you? And I'll put it this way too. Some of you are frustrated by what feels like a lack of growth in your walk with God. And if you've been in that spot for any length of time, I can almost guarantee you part of what's at play is there's an offense towards the Lord that you've not vocalized and dealt with. Because again, how are you going to trust someone who you've made a decision about what they're like and how they're going to treat you. Now, what I'm fully aware of that I'm doing right now is that I'm actually inviting you to let go of your right to have an answer. Which, to be clear, you don't actually have that. One of the reasons we choose to grasp onto offense towards God is because when something happens that doesn't make sense, like an expectation not being met, God, you're the healer. Why did my grandpa have to pass away of cancer? We, we so feel this deeply entrenched need to have a reason and to have an answer for why something unjust happens that sometimes when we have nothing else to point to, the easiest thing is to point the finger at God and say, it's your fault. And so part of what I'm aware that I'm asking you to do is that I am asking you to step into a mystery where you say, God, I don't know why this happened, but I'm choosing to trust that you're good and open myself back up to you again. And I'm aware that that's difficult. I'm aware for many of you that that is painful. But the question that I would ask you in response to that is, what are your other options? To ask it in a little more on-the-nose way, how's that bitterness treating you? So we're going to take communion here today, but 
I wanted to, uh, something that the Lord's honestly just been convicting me about, even in how we do communion, is um, there's actually, did you know there's a chunk of scripture that talks about the need to examine yourself before taking communion? Some of you do, some of you might not. So for those of you who don't, I'm just going to read it for you. This is found in 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 27, for those of you who want to go look it up later. Paul writing to Corinth says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you and may have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Something that the Lord's really been shifting in me over the last several years is if, if you grow up in sort of Western evangelical non-denomination Christianity, you look at the bread and the cup and you're like, this is a purely symbolic thing that's happening here. And I'm not going to launch into a full-on teaching about communion because that's a nuanced thing and Lord knows we don't have time for that right now. But the way that scripture talks about communion, even just in these few verses, there's something so real and so powerful that happens when we partake of this. Something so powerful and so real where we actually, do, do, have you ever stopped and thought about why we call it communion? That there's something that the Holy Spirit does where when we are obedient to Jesus's command to actually take the bread, take the cup, and to examine ourselves before we do it, that there's something that the Holy Spirit does where we actually join ourselves, not just with each other, but with Jesus. And so in light of what we've been talking about today, having many of us offense in our hearts towards God because of unmet expectations, this is a good time to examine and let the Lord bring those up. Amen? So we're going to have just maybe a minute or so of silence. And my invitation to you is just to say, Holy Spirit, like where, where do I have offense in my heart towards you? Where do I have unmet expectations toward you? And then as he brings those up, the prayer can be as simple as, God, I'm releasing that. can be as simple as saying, God, for, I, I release and renounce my right to know everything. So come Holy Spirit, search us and know us.
For some of you, that unmet expectation is probably tied in with other people that you've been holding unforgiveness towards. And the command Jesus gives us is to forgive. So I'm going to pray this prayer for me and you can agree with what I'm praying for yourself just even as we're getting ready to take communion. Father, I repent. I repent for where I've allowed these little offenses, these things to sneak into my heart. that I've used to justify holding you at arm's length in different areas of my life. God, I surrender my right to know. Forgive me for holding offense towards you. Forgive me for the pride of believing I could stand in judgment over you. In Jesus' name. So Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken. We thank you for the bread. We thank you that when you saw us, even as it was shared this morning in worship, when you saw us actively sinning against you, you didn't say, let them go to hell where they deserve to go. You said, I think I'll die in their place. You said, I think I'll let my body be broken for them. We thank you for your stripes that heal us, God. As we take the bread, we thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for your blood that cleanses us from sin. We thank you for your blood that frees us from the power of the enemy and from darkness. We thank you for your blood that makes a way for us to be in union with you. We thank you for your mercy, Jesus. We love you, God. We bless you. Thank you for your blood as we take the cup. As we get ready to close today, I want us to just go back into worship with that song, um, that new song that our team wrote. And when we go back into singing it, I just want us to go back in knowing that it's a done deal. Messages like these can be hard to li listen to sometimes. They can feel heavy because you've got some random guy with a mustache getting all up in your business. But as the, the beautiful thing about repentance is that when, when we turn, it's done. Do you understand that when you repent, when you turn, it's actually dealt with? And that's even the beauty of communion. It's, it's a literal reminder to your own soul, this was paid for. So I want us to go back and sing this, but again, when you sing, 
Don't sing with condemnation. Don't sing with rejection. Stand up and remind your own soul that God was good enough to bring something to my attention and that's actually dealt with now. So I want you to stand as we sing.
Invite our prayer team to come forward. Um, some of you may not have given your life to Jesus, and when you're hearing us talk about the kind of mercy that God offers for people, you may say, Hey, I think I need some of that. I think I'm ready to stop running. If that's you, we have these people down here who would love to pray with you, love to talk to you. Um, for some of you, like, I, I really saw this as I was even preparing for this morning. I, I think that there are some of you who are going to receive physical healing in your bodies today, specifically around, um, there was a block with what I was talking about, that there was an anger or bitterness towards the Lord that was making it hard for you to receive. Um, so I'm even going to just take a quick second and have, if you came in and you repented from some stuff, but you came in with pain in your physical body, I want you to just move around. Because there's something that happens when we just release that stuff to the Lord. He's faithful to come in. But if you need prayer for physical healing, if you need prayer for anything, if you need to receive Jesus, these people are going to be here ready to pray for you. And I'm even, I'm just going to take a step out here because I think the Lord's doing something. If you walked in with pain and you're already, like, you've moved your body around and you're feeling better, can you just wave a hand at me? We got one right there. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Lift a hand way up high for me just so we can look around and see. We got a couple. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Cloud the size of a man's hand is what I'll call that. So again, if you need prayer for anything... We've got people here. We want to pray for you, but I'm just going to pray and bless you guys as you go. So, Father, I thank you for what you're doing. Jesus, we thank you that you are faithful and loving enough to pull us back into a relationship where we're out of, out of alignment with you, God. So I pray for a filling over your people. I pray for a blessing to fall on them as they go. God, I thank you that um, you're affecting change in people's hearts, that transformation would actually come. Jesus, we love you, we bless you, and I bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right, have a blessed Sunday, everybody.